All right, everyone. Welcome back to Financial Clarity for Doctors. I'm Corey Janoff, joined as always by Rochelle Vanderzanden. Hello. And this is episode 100. Woohoo! <laughs> Woo, party! Who would have thought we made it this far, Rochelle? We've been doing this almost four years now. And I record... honestly didn't think about it at all. I wasn't like, how long are we going to do this? It was just like, we're going to do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, we didn't have any defined goal. Nope. But uh, here we are, 100 strong and still going. And it, it, I know it's kind of weird in your feed if you're on Apple or I don't know if Spotify numbers them, but because we've started mixing in some audio versions of our blog posts. So there's more than 100 published recordings, but this is the official 100th episode of the podcast, you know, not mm-hmm. counting the audio blog posts that we've done. Um, but yeah, we, we, you know, for our 50th episode, we did had some fun finding 50 quotes about money. We wanted to try and do something fun for the 100th episode. So, you know, we, we wanted to put together a, a list of some universal principles or about money. Um, you know, I've been doing this going on 15 years now. I've observed a lot of people's finances. I've read a lot about finances and and I've concluded that personal finance has much more to do with human behavior and psychology than it does with math and numbers. I mean, the numbers are the easy part. If that's all it boiled down to, everyone would achieve all of their financial goals. You just save X dollars for Y years and you'll achieve the objective. But if you have enough money. Correct. Um, well, again, if it, you know, you just live within your means and then you, you make, to, like, make change it your goals a little bit, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Assuming they're reasonable. Yeah, yes. absolutely. But, you know, humans aren't robots. We're social animals. We compare ourselves to others. We have emotions. We behave irrationally at times. And, and all of that spills over into our personal finances and investment decisions. So, um, yeah, there is like what's the saying about personal finance? It's a lot more personal than finance. So there, mm-hmm. there, it's hard to find, you know, things that are consistent for everyone. You know, how much should I save for retirement? It depends. You know, what, you know, how much should I put into this account versus that account? It depends. Like, should I pay off debt versus invest? It depends. Rochelle and I's favorite answer. It depends. <laughs> yep. So um, but yeah, we, we, we put together a, a laundry list of things that we think apply to pretty much everyone. I'm sure you could find exceptions. Um, and, and then we wanted to try and distill it down into just a handful of principles, kind of like how George Carlin distilled the Ten Commandments down into two commandments. And if you haven't seen his stand-up bit about that, YouTube it. Um, not safe for work, but uh, hilarious. <laughs> um and then after we put together our list, we did what any logical, lazy human being would do, and we asked ChatGPT that same question. What are some universal principles of money? And we very quickly got an answer, which is impressive. Um, so maybe let's start there, Rochelle. Yeah, absolutely. So I don't know about any reasonable person. I have barely even heard about ChatGPT, much less used it, but Corey is cool, and he's on the cutting edge of things, so he definitely has. <laughs> But when he just added in what are some universal principles of money, it actually came up with some pretty good responses. Um, And there's several that apply kind of whether you make a lot of money or you live in California or New York or you live in Japan. Like there's a lot of different things that make sense no matter where you are. Um, I think that a big one is the time value of money. And that principle just states that money is worth more in the present than it is in the future because right now it can be invested or used to generate income and you can't do anything with it if you don't have it yet. So as a result, it's generally better to receive money sooner than later. So I think that can apply to things like, you know, whether you get a sign-on bonus or a retention bonus, anything like that. So if you can have more money upfront, that's going to be good for you financially. Want to go back and forth with these, Corey? Sure. Okay. Yeah. The second one that artificial intelligence gave us was risk and reward. Um, I'll just read it verbatim. The principle of risk and reward suggests that the potential reward of an investment should be proportionate to the risk involved. In other words, the more risk you take on, the greater the potential reward should be. Mm-hmm. 100% true. You know, it doesn't, hard to, to, to sometimes, you know, pin down what the actual math is, but, you know, definitely the more risk you take on, the more potential 
uh, you have for reward. That's why generally stocks tend over time to to give you greater returns than bonds versus cash. Um, you know, buying lottery tickets, we know odds are you're going to lose all your money, whatever you spend on lottery tickets, but the potential reward is hundreds of millions in some cases. So, mm-hmm. you know, or even upwards of a billion every once in a while. So, you know, uh, risk reward, um, they go hand in hand. Yep. Uh, diversification is number three. That's the practice of spreading your money across multiple investments to reduce risk. And this principle suggests that it's generally better to invest in a variety of assets rather than putting all your money in one place. It's kind of related to the risk reward piece. Like by diversifying, you're taking on a little bit less risk, maybe also limiting your upside potential by doing that. Like, you know, you don't have everything in that one thing that could potentially knock it out of the park, but you've spread it out. So if that one thing fails, you're not just exposed to that one thing. Yeah. If you're constantly swinging for home runs, you're going to strike out a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, next one, number four, inflation uh, is pretty universal. Inflation can impre- increase the price of goods and services over time. Um, you know, blah, 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 basically, you know, factor inflation into your financial decisions because it can easily erode the value of your purchasing power and your money over time. So that's, we've harped on this numerous times before, if you've been listening to us, you know, one of the biggest risks to your long-term financial plan is inflation. Even just historically average inflation cost of living is going to be double what it is today, 25, 30 years from now. So we need to make sure our you know, assets grow ideally at least with inflation, if not faster than inflation, so we can maintain our standard of living throughout our lifetime. Yep. Number five is opportunity cost. If you've taken Econ 101, you might know what this is. Maybe you don't remember. <laughs> but basically, opportunity cost is the value of the next best alternative that you give up when making any financial decisions. So example is let's put $5,000 down on a car. Um, If we didn't have to put that $5,000 down on the car, what else could we do with that $5,000? What's the next best thing that we could have done with that $5,000? And this principle suggests that it's really important to consider the trade-offs involved in any financial decision and choose the option that provides the greatest benefit. So this is math like comes down to math, period. Um, again, a lot of times psychology comes into things and we don't always make the, the decision that makes the most mathematical sense. But ideally, we are looking at those trade-offs and making at least that assessment before we decide on what we're doing. Yeah, and we'll talk about this more when we get to Rochelle and I's list. But um, you know, economic forecasts, economic models, they very often... You know, the world play often plays out differently than the model suggests because, again, humans are irrational. We don't always make the optimal decision. So, um, I, one of my favorite quotes is, "Economic forecasting was created to make astrology look respectable." So, mm-hmm. um, anyways, number six. So the the sixth and final uh, universal principle of money that Chat GPT gave us: compound interest. Compound interest is interest earned on both the principal amount and any accumulated interest. So basically, the sooner you start saving, the more your money can compound on top of itself. So, you know, if you're you invest $100 and you get 10% interest on it, hypothetically, after a year you have $110. Year 2, if you get another 10% interest, you know, you would have 10% on that 110 dollar not the original 100 so you would get $11 of interest in year 2 and then you you know year 3 get 10% on the you know new $121 balance and it just continues to compound and compound and exponentially increase over time so that's why you know it takes a long time to to accumulate your first million but then it goes a lot faster after that absolutely so that's a lot of math i think <laughs> And then when we bring it back to the psychology and things like that, it's important to look at the things that we can't necessarily quantify. And that's a big part of planning too. So number one on Corey and Rochelle's universal principles of money list is that bad luck can happen to anyone. So, I mean, we'll talk about the inverse of this in just a second, but realistically, even if you're working hard, you're a good person, you eat healthy, you exercise, all of that, sometimes 
stuff still, still happens. Like sometimes we still have health issues. Sometimes we still have family emergencies. Sometimes we still lose a job or our house could burn down. Investments can go wrong. Like all of those things that can happen. So it's really important to make sure that you're living below your means so that you create a cushion for yourself in case that bad stuff does happen. And also that you have maybe some insurances to share those risks with an insurance carrier if there's something that you really can't protect yourself from. I think the home burning down is a great example. You know, if you have homeowner's insurance, something happens to your house, maybe you can't replace your $750,000 home out of pocket, but the insurance can help you take care of that. Yep. And then the other side of that coin is good luck happens too. And acknowledge that it's luck. You know, we, we often as humans attribute good fortune to our own personal success and and misfortune to just luck where where they go hand in hand. You know, so like you could look at plenty of examples in your life. Like for, for me, I was born a white male in America to college educated parents who earned above average income. Like I, I was literally born with a head start compared to 95% of the world. You know, if I was born in, you know, a poor village in, you know, a you know, South America or, you know, Africa, you know, it probably wouldn't be where I'm at today. Um, you know, and sometimes when it comes to life or investing or whatever, just it's better to be lucky than good. You know, sometimes you get lucky with your investments. You join a company, they go public, you, you make a killing from from the stock options that you received when you started there. You know, you can have planned that in advance. Um, you know, when and where you were born, where you live. Like if you were a woman born in Iran, you know, or Afghanistan, like like life's probably not that great for you. And that's by no, you know, you that's totally out of your control. Um, you know, I guess we're talking on the good luck side of it, but you know, that goes on the bad luck side of it. Much better to be born in America than, than some other countries. You know, Mark Cuban, owner of the Dallas Mavericks, many people are aware of who he is. He acknowledges his outside success. A, a lot of it's due to luck. You know, he's, I've heard him in interviews before say he could, he believes confidently he could start a successful business again, sell it off, make a good uh, return on it. But being able to do it during one of the largest stock market booms in our history is just pure luck. And for those who aren't familiar, he started a company called broadcast.com that essentially was like the first internet radio company and sold it to Yahoo for $5.7 billion in 1999. Um, so he, 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 uh, and then he, you know, bought the Mavericks for like 240 million with some of his proceeds and now they're worth several billion dollars. So, you know, uh, luck works both ways, both good and bad. Yep. I think one of the reasons it's really important to acknowledge that luck plays a part in this is that if you don't, you sometimes become very overconfident in your ability <laughs> to make future good investing decisions and things like that. So, oh, I, I totally knocked that out of the park. I can do this again over and over and over again. But really, if a huge part of it was luck, that's not easily to, to replicate. And we don't want to necessarily bank on that all the time. Um, I think hand in hand with that part is that there is there's always uncertainties in the world. So that's another just basic principle. But the, the world operates on probabilities like once in a lifetime events happen often, like maybe the storm of the century happens once a century. And honestly, that's been happening more frequently lately. But all of these things we can point to that are very, very rare but rare occurrences happen frequently if we take all of them and put them together. So Hurricane Katrina, 9-11, COVID, like a big economic downturn, like all of these things may not happen at the same time. And it may be fairly rare that the individual things happen, but there's lots of large events that are unpredictable that will happen in our lifetime. So we just kind of have to be prepared for uncertainty to a certain extent. And as humans, I think we crave certainty. Like we want that's why people have a financial plan, right? Like you want to build in a plan. You want to know what's going to happen next and next and next and next. But you have to be prepared for the the things that life is going to throw at all of us. And the sooner you accept that, the more content you'll be. Like you're not, yeah. It's, it's important not to like build that certainty into your life and then just feel like everything is disrupted once in a while when those things inevitably happen. Yeah, no, I think really important the sooner you accept that the world is uncertain you know and a lot of it's out of your control the more content you will be 
you know, certainty, really easy to sell, really hard to deliver. You know, this is literally why Ponzi schemes exist because people don't want to deal with the ups and downs of the stock market, but they get some, you know, sweet talking salesman, like I can get you 8% a year with no losses. Okay. Sign me up. Um, well, it sounds too good to be true. It, it probably is. Uh, mm -hmm. So kind of along the same lines, uh, one of my favorite quotes from a, a gentleman named Carl Richards, who's been on the podcast, great author. Uh, he's got a couple good books that I suggest you all read. The Behavior Gap is one of them. And the One Page Financial Plan is another. But one of uh, his sayings about risk is, risk is what's left over after you think you've thought of everything. So true. You know, we can plan ahead. We can think of all the contingencies, you know, all right, if this happens and we do that, if that happens and we do this, but you know, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's what you don't see coming that gets you um, kind of going back to some of the, 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 you know, crazy events like nine 11 COVID hurricane Katrina, et cetera. Um, winning the lottery. If we're talking on the good side, you know, don't see that one coming, but it could happen. You never know. Absolutely. Um, kind of switching away from uncertainty. I think another good principle is just to live below your means. And this is more, I don't know, I think common sense. And I think a lot of people understand this already. But life is much less stressful if you are living below your means. Because you know that you have a little bit of a cushion. You have flexibility to adjust when emergencies come up. You're able to save some for the future, which is great too. Um, and there's lots of different things that that builds into your financial plan, that builds into your life, that just makes it easier. And so a lot of that is based on your fixed expenses, like your housing cost, your car payment, like all of that kind of stuff. So if you can focus on those things and minimize those as much as possible, that's going to be really helpful long term for planning. Yes. Number six, if we're even keeping track here. Um, mm -hmm. People have different backgrounds, family circumstances, goals, desires, et cetera. And, and you know, this is why people argue all the time about politics, religion, how to raise your kids, how to invest. Like it's really hard to find, you know, uh, that's why when we were putting this episode together, that there are very few universal truths that apply to everyone because everyone's different. It depends, you know, what's the best investment for you. It, it, it really depends on a number of factors. Uh, Morgan Housel, another great author, recommend reading his book, Psychology of Money, if you haven't read that one. And he, he has about a weekly blog um, that he does as well. But he, he describes the stock market as a place where people playing different games with different rules all come together and clash. You know, Day traders heavily impact the current prices of stocks, um, but that also impacts how long-term investors fare. Like if you're doing dollar cost averaging money into an index fund every single uh, month, you know, you're buying stocks at whatever the going rate is, regardless of whether uh, an analyst would, would view that as a good value or not. You know, the day trader is just coming in, hoping the price goes up in a matter of hours, and they're going to get out of that trade before the end of the day, maybe the next day at the latest. doesn't matter if it's a good value or a good buy. They just are hoping someone else will pay slightly more for it after they buy it, and they turn around and sell it. That's their game that they're playing. That is the opposite of the game you should be playing. <laughs> if you're listening <laughs> to this podcast and investing for your <clears throat> retirement, totally different. So it, it, again, it, 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 you got to remember that, that people are, are operating on a different set of rules, playing different games, have different objectives, and, and we can all yell and scream and shout at each other. But if we just take a step back and realize, all right, they're doing it this way for their reasons, and I'm going to do it this way for my reasons. Um, yeah. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, patience is a virtue. I think that's probably the greatest ingredient you have when you're investing. So Warren Buffett was investing for 80 or has been investing for 80 plus years, but more than 99% of his wealth came after his 50th birthday. So at age 47, his net worth was 67 million in like 1979, 1980. Um, if he retired then, like a 47 year old could potentially, if you had $67 million, we never would have heard of him. But at this point, he's worth much, much more than that. And I think that this may not always be your goal, 
But if your goal is to generate as much wealth as possible, then really it's it's leaving your money invested as long as possible. Yeah, so that's definitely a big part of it. Yeah, and I, and I don't know if like putting that in is to just, hey, here's how you become a billionaire or 100 billionaire. It's just it, it, the, going back to the compounding interest, it takes time. Time mm -hmm. is that key ingredient to your investments growing. You can't rush it. Um, there is no tried and true get rich quick scheme but there are plenty there there is a, a get rich slow scheme <laughs> continually invest live below your means invest a, set, a portion of your paycheck and then watch it grow over time it'd be like you know what's the best time to plant a tree well 30 years ago well second best time now and and you know it, it'll take some time to grow but it'll eventually become a big big tree if you mm -hmm. give it enough time and just be patient um, let's see. Number eight, separate investing from entertainment. Real, true investing should be very boring. Um, see that previous note about patience that we just walked through. Um, if you need entertainment, go to a show, you know, set up a play account with a small amount of money that you can afford to lose if it needs to be related to investing. But but really, uh, your, your investments shouldn't be exciting at all. <laughs> Again, depending on your goals, I <laughs> I guess we shouldn't judge the day traders if that's their job, but that's generally not going to be your goal. <laughs> well, there's a reason there's different names for it, trading versus investing. Yeah, absolutely. Very true. Okay. I think uh, number nine is that you need to save and invest a healthy portion of your income to achieve financial objectives. If your objective is to be at all financially independent and not rely on your income at some point in time, that's what you're going to need to do. If you spend all of your earnings you're going to have to work a really long time to be able to sustain that lifestyle in retirement. You're not going to be able to retire and just live on social security because if you've been spending every dollar that you earn, chances are that's much, much more than your social security income would be when you retire. So it, it's really important. I think that, you know, living within your means and investing a solid portion of your income go hand in hand. And it does a couple of things. It kind of helps you spend less it helps you save more, and then it becomes much easier to retire at a reasonable age and maintain your lifestyle without having to make any changes. For sure. Well said. All right. Number 10, uh, we're, we're at the turn here for those with those of you who are golfers um, on, the, <laughs> on the back nine. Um, <laughs> independence, autonomy, control of your time. You know, that is the ultimate form of success and happiness, you know, having a sense of control over your life, being able to do what you want, when you want, with whom you want, on your own terms, you know, is I think ultimately what's going to create the most amount of happiness for people. And really, we could spend an entire episode on this point, because I don't know if it gets enough attention, you know, we're always focused on some dollar amount, or how much money do we need to be financially independent? You know, how much money do we need for to pay for college? But but I mean, and you don't have to be filthy rich to be able to, to do those things. Just being able to have a sense of control of what you're doing, like being able to work autonomously in your job, have a say in, in how your day goes is very powerful rather than being, you know, just told what to do, um, you know, every single day that you show up. So, uh, you know, that could mean a number of different things for different people. And, you know, you define what that means for you. But essentially being able, having a sense of control, being able to do things on your own terms, I think that's going to, that ultimately is what's going to make you content. Mm -hmm. A lot of times that goes hand in hand with financial independence. If you're at the point where you don't need your job anymore, then really that's a pretty powerful feeling. Like, hey, I don't have to be here if I don't want to be here. <laughs> and it doesn't mean you don't have to work. Like you may yeah. like working. That's great. Absolutely. But when, mm -hmm. you know, you can work on your own terms in that scenario. You know, That's if you don't great. like the job, you can change the job. Mm -hmm. Even if it's lower paying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I like this one a lot, but next principle is just that people care a lot less about you than you think. So stop trying to impress them. <laughs> I think this is like both a financial thing and a non-financial thing. But if you ever come home from a social event and wonder like, what did that person think about what I said in that conversation? Or why did I not say that differently? Like, oh, I hate what I was wearing. Why did I not choose to wear something else? Like, do you think that the people that were at that party went home and thought about what you said and what you were wearing and what 
you chose to do that event, like they're thinking about themselves. And I think that that's true generally is that human beings tend to be pretty self-involved. So stop thinking that everyone else cares about <laughs> how you're presenting yourself. And obviously, like we want to be kind and you want to, you know, you want to put your best foot forward all the time, but don't worry about it too much. We really don't need to be impressing people generally. Yeah. It's a job interview. Then they're thinking about it. <laughs> but even so, they're thinking about themselves. How can this person help me? Yeah. And, <laughs> but uh, all right. Along the same lines, comparing yourself to others, fear of missing out, FOMO. It's the easiest way to be unhappy. So, and avoiding this is possibly the easiest way to become happy and financially independent. So, once you stop trying to impress people with outward displays of status, whatever that means, you know, whether it's house, cars, clothes, vacations, photo ops for Instagram, you know, you'll be able to direct more of your money towards your ultimate financial objective of that, you know, independence, autonomy, control over your time. So, um, yeah, stop trying to keep up with the Joneses, stop trying to impress people, focus on you, worry about you mm -hmm. and life will be much better for you. Absolutely. Easier yeah, said than done. It's true. Absolutely. I think there's always like that grass is greener on the other side thing, but being content and right now and what you have right now is, is very, very powerful. And that kind of relates to the next one, which is just, you know, your reality minus your expectations of what that reality are equals your satisfaction. So if you expect a lot and what you have is slightly less than that, you may be unhappy. But if you have, you know, pretty modest expectations of what lifestyle is going to be like, and then you earn enough to live a pretty comfortable lifestyle, you're going to be very well satisfied. So obviously we want to maintain our expectations in a way that our income very easily supports those expectations and not start outstripping our income and thinking that we need more than we can adequately provide for ourselves. So it's just a, a matter of, you know, aligning those expectations with what's reasonable and achievable in your life. Yeah. You know, try and keep those expectations in check. You know, if your expectations rise faster than your income or net worth, you're never going to be satisfied. So which kind of like, Goes along with the next point, number 14, learn what is enough. Once you can say you have enough, you've won the money game. You'll be able to live out your independence, autonomy, have control of your time because you have enough. You can say you have enough. Again, easier said than done, but trying to figure out what, what is enough for me, what makes me content, you know, it's not, it's generally not more stuff. Um, so figure out what that, what enough is for you and strive for that. Mm -hmm. related to the luck items is just that most things are outside of your control so really it's important to focus on the things that you can control and those are the ones that actually matter when we're trying to plan because like you can control probably how much you're spending how much you're saving um you can control things like when you retire as long as you're physically able to work still so if we can control on, on those types of, or focus on those types of things, then you don't have to worry quite as much about the things that you don't have control over, because honestly, those are going to happen no matter what. <laughs> yeah. Find that intersection of things you can control that actually matter. So like draw a Venn diagram, one circle is things that matter. The other circle is things that you control and the part where the two circles overlap that's that's where we want to focus our energy and attention. There are plenty of things that matter that are out of your control. You know, like mm -hmm. the health stuff is kind of one of them. Um, you know, again, you can eat healthy exercise, but you know, there's some things you, you might end up having a heart attack or getting cancer. You can do whatever you can to reduce your risk, but some of it's just bad luck. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but do but focus on what you can and and hopefully everything else works out. Um Let's see, I lost our spot. Here we go. Number 16, big things matter a lot more than little things. You know, the career you choose, your spouse, the house you live in, the city you live in, you know, how much you save, you know, all that probably accounts to 90% of, you know, if you really living below your means and saving a large percentage of your income will probably solve 90% of 
all financial issues and problems that you may come across. Um, you know, should I pick this mutual fund or that mutual fund? You know, what's the expense ratio of this 500 index versus that 500? Doesn't matter. Does not matter. Um, <laughs> you know, how much you save, you know, will, will, will make up, will, will, will impact your ability to achieve financial independence way more than which S&P 500 index fund you go with. Absolutely. Yep. Um, I think this is a, a good one, but there's, I don't know how to condense this. There's a lot of different financial products out there that are excellent if they are used for their intended purpose, but potentially very, very bad if they're used incorrectly. So when we are thinking about making financial choices, buying financial products, things like that, it's really important to understand what they are and what their purpose is. So that can include things like real estate, annuities, life insurance, all of these things that have a very bad reputation sometimes, like especially annuities and life insurance and things like that. But if they are used for their intended purpose, they can be good tools. So you just want to make sure that you're you're in a situation where you're understanding you're, you're playing by the same rules as other people's on the playing field. So if everyone has the same understanding of those products, that is a good thing. So make sure that when you are thinking about these things, you are educating yourselves. Yeah, and just yeah, absolutely. Understanding what the right tool for the job is, um, which is you know partly what Rochelle and I's job is to help you figure out, you know, mm -hmm. as financial advisors, um, you know, if your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, and it may not, you know, work out that way. If it's you know, if you need to saw a board in half, the hammer is not gonna going to help you much. Um, mm -hmm. So let's see. Last couple here. Small actions compounded over time lead to big results. Kind of gets back to the patience thing. But like, if you want to lose weight, start walking. You know, Go for a walk every day. Slowly increase how far you walk. You want to build up muscle, do a few push-ups and sit-ups and squats at home and gradually increase the number that you do. Just be consistent with it. You do it every day, you'll see results. Persistence and consistency over time is key. You know, so save a portion of every single paycheck for your financial objectives and 30 years from now, you'll be pretty impressed with what you achieved. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't really feel immense in, in the early stages. You may not see any difference in the first few weeks, months, years, really. Um you know, but you know, over time, it, it'll definitely add up. Yep. Last one here. I mean, we talked a lot about being content with what you have and things like that. But realistically, there's always going to be a certain amount of greed and a certain amount of fear that plays into the decisions that we're making. Like we're human. We have emotions. The stock market's never going to be completely efficient because it is comprised of a whole bunch of different humans making decisions that are not necessarily rational. They're making decisions based on greed, fear, trying to make sure that, you know, they're not losing money, they are making money, and they're not necessarily going to be rational all the time. So that's why bank runs happen. That's why stock market bursts in the, those bubbles sometimes. That's why there's housing bubbles sometimes, all of these different things. So again, that plays into that. And you know, like you can't expect everything, can't necessarily anticipate what's going to happen next all the time, but just try to manage your own emotions and your own decision making as best as possible. Yeah. So that's our list. Now, if we kind of boil it down into just a handful of different ones, there's a lot of overlap in there, a lot of things that kind of fall into the same category. Um, but I think first and foremost, uncertainty, luck, risk, they're omnipresent, accept it. Like the world's uncertain. There's going to be good luck. There's going to be bad luck. A lot of things are out of your control. You just got to accept it and be content with it. The sooner you can accept that, the easier it'll be to, to make your way through life. Um, you want to take yeah. number two? <laughs> sure. Our emotions, <clears throat> how we view ourselves, how we perceive others, they have a massive influence on the financial decisions that we make and the behavior that we exhibit in terms of like making decisions about finances. So it's not always going to be about the numbers. We just do our best to kind of control that piece of it. And then how to achieve financial independence can really just be summed up in a short sentence. Live below your means and invest a portion of your earnings consistently over time. 
Yep. And then I think the ultimate form of financial well-being is just being able to do what you want when you want with whom you want on your own terms. So just knowing that if you're working, it's because you want to work. If you're not working, it's because you don't have to. <laughs> and then being content with what you have is a huge part of that too. There we go. We made it through that faster than I thought we would. We talk fast. Yeah. Episode 100. <laughs> so thank you for listening. Yeah. Thank you all for, for the, uh, for following us over the last, what, three and a half years since we started almost four years since we started this and look forward to look forward to keeping it rolling. So Absolutely. feel free to shoot us an email, message us, whatever, with any suggestions, critiques, thoughts, stuff you want us to talk about on the podcast, you know, definitely appreciate ratings and reviews. If you like the show helps others find it. Uh, but yeah, we'll see you next time with episode 101. Have a good day, everyone.